Thank you. You may be seated. Good morning. We are here for oral argument in case number CV 18-0201 Johnson versus Queen Creek and the ACC. We, as you may know, we record these pleadings, so please give us the, your name and the name of your client when you approach the podium. Each side has 20 minutes for your argument, and you are in charge of keeping track of your own time. I understand you may be sharing time, so uh, follow the clock at the podium. We will not be assisting you with that. Clock maintenance. Um, please keep in mind that we have read your briefs and studied the record. We've discussed the case in conference, and with that, you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honors. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to start by with a discussion of something that's not in the papers, and it's a, a fundamental um, issue, and that's a threshold determination on the threshold issue of whether or not a document qualifies as a public record. And your name for the record? I'm sorry, Daniel Fredenberg on behalf of Johnson Utilities LLC. Um, it's the, the threshold determination of whether or not in the context of reviewing the confidential information and executing the MNDA in uh, the context of a, a due diligence for a potential acquisition, there is no government duty to engage in such activity. And so this was an entirely volitional exercise between the town and Johnson. And so the duty component on under Salt River um, doesn't apply here and so that's but counsel was this issue raised before the Superior Court whether or not specifically whether or not argument you're making here today yes your honor it was because the the issue of um, whether or not this information was of a private nature was embodied in the MN MNDA well, I'm confused because you started your argument by saying you wanted to talk about an issue that was not in the briefing before this court, not directly in in the briefing, Your Honor. It was, it, it's been mentioned in connection with reference to um, the Griffiths case, and also in discussion with the with the MNDA, um, and so that's an issue that I think is is important before we get down the road of the Griffiths exception, which I think the court misapplied in construing that, that the court had no power under Griffiths to direct the town of Cave Creek um, to, to refrain or not disclose, um, that's squarely afoul of the holding in Griffiths itself. And so um, the, the point behind all this, Your Honor, is that when the town proposed the MNDA to Johnson as a predicate to supplying the confidential information, it removed its discretion because in the recitals, paragraph one, of the ND MNDA, it says that the requesting party, uh, the producing party would grant access to obtain confidential and or business information that it dires, desires to be kept in confidence. And so once they've made that acknowledgement and, and provided Johnson Utilities with the authority to determine what is confidential and what is not, that removes the discretionary um, point of under Griffiths because as as the statutes point out um, there's clearly a method for which the town can produce these documents however create a privilege log uh, to in, to exclude privileged or confidential information and that's um, 39-121-01-D2 um, so before we get down the road of whether or not there's a public um, interest out, outweighing the protection of the confidential documents, I believe the trial court skipped over the determination of whether or not the MNDA 
removes the town's discretion from doing the Griffiths two-part balancing test. So we don't even get to step two. However, when we talk about step two, um, hypothetically, I think it's important to put this in the context of the broader picture here. And I would posit the following analogy to the court. If this were um, Tesla or Apple, who was considering opening a plant and they're in negotiations or discussions with the town of Cave Creek, there's going to be a similar exchange and there's going to be a, an MNDA in that context. And if the law is that, as Judge Warner concluded, is that the public record statute trumps private confidentiality agreements, then we're going to have a situation where Tesla is going to have their business projections, their confidential um, trade secrets, things like that, that are all of a sudden um, vulnerable to, uh, through a public records request, their competitors can get this information. Clearly, had Johnson known that the town would take the position that effectively the MNDA is illusory, then it wouldn't have engaged in this. And so if the law is going to be that public records trumps a private contract, the public policy flowing from that is going to inhibit companies wanting to move here because they will not have any expectation that their private confidential information, as agreed by the, the town, uh, would be maintained or be subject to a public records request. And that's something um, that we discussed with uh, Judge Warner, and, and apparently he disagreed with our position, but I think that's uh, a caution that needs to be exercised when you're looking at the impacts of making such uh, an exception to an exception, for lack of a better term, that uh, the trial court found. I think it's also important. Is it fair to say that it was your burden at the trial court to demonstrate that the records that you want withheld were not public records? Yes. And how did you meet that burden? It's, I don't see any uh, information in the record as to what the document, what information the documents contain that renders them not public. Well, it's the MNDA. The MNDA does gives the producing party Johnson the ability to designate. Let's say that, let's just walk down the road. Let's say that we don't believe that the private agreement trumps the statute. Let's say the statute declares these, these documents to be public records. What have you done in the record to demonstrate that they should be, that nonetheless they should not be disclosed because they are an exception to disclosure or they contain information that is inherently uh, not disclosable. What what have what have you done in the record to meet that burden, other than point to a private agreement in an attempt to trump a statute? Just to clarify your question, are you specifically asking as to the the information, the data that's the subject of the request? What did Johnson do below to identify how that that information is genuinely confidential? I'm, I'm yes. Okay. Um, we didn't get to that point. The court didn't request, and neither did the requesting parties, challenge our designation that the Carollo report in its entirety is confidential. So it would be actually the burden upon the requesting party to request that the court conduct an in-camera review if they want to challenge our designation of confidentiality. But the court didn't even get to that point. The court didn't even have the Carollo report, nor did it, it request it uh, for in-camera review. The point behind Johnson suggest an in-camera review or or that was a fallback a proffer that was a fallback position but the, the position was these don't qualify as public records so we don't even get to the point of an in-camera review and uh, from a practical standpoint um, judge uh, um, judge Warner was filling in for judge Stevens and was rotating off um, so on the, the time frame of the TRO. He continued the TRO for five days to seek uh, our, our remedy of a stay here. Um, that just simply didn't get developed fully on the record because the request wasn't made. There's been no challenge to our designation of confidentiality of the Corolla report. 
touch on a, a few of the points uh, raised in um, the opposition briefs, and, and that is concerning um, health and safety. There was an argument developed that there is a health and safety issue here. Um, there was no evidence in the record below that there was any need for this engineering data um, in order to address issues of public health and safety. That would actually fall into the jurisdiction of the ADEQ. And so the, the notion and the inference that there was an imminent health and safety issue that compelled or, or was a rationale for the um, public, the balancing the public interest, that simply wasn't developed. There's been arguments, um, but there's simply no evidence that was introduced below. And so I believe that's a, uh, an attempt to politicize um, the issue by the opposition. It's also important to note that the initial request from the commission was actually just a request for communications. Those communications were voluntarily provided. The only issue that, that Johnson had was the fact that town, the town was on its own initiative per, um, intending to produce the Corolla report, which wasn't even requested. Now, when the ACC intervened, they later corrected that statement, um, but, but the, <coughs> it shouldn't be lost on the panel that the actual proponent of production was not the ACC, it was the town. And the town um, was asked below, why are you taking a side in this? Because as, as the public entity, one would think they would remain neutral and not take a position, they would be guided by the court. But it's important to note that in the ACC <coughs> proceedings, the, the town is actually has intervened and is prosecuting the case side by side with the ACC. So against that backdrop, it's important to note <coughs> that what, what the point of the Corolla report is, is it serves no governmental purpose for the public to be able to review engineering data. It's not the official business of the uh, town of King Creek and its operations pursuant to law that it must review engineering data with potential uh, acquisition targets. So there is a very um, significant privacy right that the parties agreed in advance where there would be a methodology to protect that. And in paragraph Fifteen uh, of the MNDA, that right was recognized where the town acknowledged that there would be irreparable injury to the uh, disclosing party should the confidential information um, be provided. And so the, the controlling agreement is replete with recognition by the town that these are private confidential documents. Um, I don't have anything further. I'll save the rest of my time on rebuttal unless you have any questions that are uh, at the forefront of your minds. Thank you. Good morning. May it please the court, my name is Scott Holcomb. I'm an attorney at Dickinson Wright, but I also serve as the town attorney for the town of Queen Creek. Um, with me at council table is Naomi Davis. She's a staff attorney for the ACC who has intervened in this case. We're going to try to divide up our time so that we can address any questions that the court has. But how that's done is going to be largely dependent on the questions that the panel has for us. Um, let me start off by saying um, I, it's a little hard for me to do a response to what was just said because what was described is a proceeding that didn't occur. Um, and, 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 it, and it totally misconstrues the uh, agreement, the uh, mutual non-disclosure agreement and its purpose, its function and what it actually says. Uh, there was a full trial on the merits by, by 
by agreement of the parties, if you look at the judgment, the parties agreed that they would accelerate the trial and the entire trial on the merits was held. They had every opportunity to provide and uh, for Johnson Utilities to come forward and uh, meet its burden, as, as Judge uh, Perkins referenced, to show that these documents were confidential and that they were not only confidential but uh, exempt from a disclosure under the public records uh, request. So there's four straightforward questions that I think with clear answers that resolve the, this case and Judge Warner properly resolved it. First, are the records in the possession of Queen Creek public records under the law? Yes. And in fact, it's interesting that um, the appellant in a reply brief admitted that. If you look at page two of their reply brief, under the heading, the first first paragraph under the heading, the confidential documents are not public records. They say, on this issue, appellant contends that because this information was gathered in connection with deciding whether to use town monies to acquire the utilities, these documents must therefore be public records. And perhaps in the absence of the MNDA, the Net Mutual Non-Disclosure Act, that position would be viable. Here, however, Arizona law is clear that the definition of public records does not extend to documents of purely private nature. They admit in their actual pleading that, and just admit it now, the purpose for which Queen Creek received those documents was to do its due diligence as to potentially spending over a hundred million dollars in order to buy a public, buy a private utility, make it a public utility. That, by definition, under the statute, um, under ARS 39.121.01 and the 121, that is by definition public records. There are records that were received by Queen Creek in order to determine whether to expend public funds for a public purpose. That is the quintessential definition of a public record. So the question that is, and you've you've heard nothing else other than that these are not public records. Only that that cha is changed by the mutual non-disclosure agreement. Okay, does the mutual non-disclosure agreement, in fact, uh, make these confidential records or preclude disclosure? And that's really where you end up. It's not just doesn't end at whether these are confidential, but whether disclosure is precluded. And the absolute answer is no. There's nothing in that agreement the mutual non-disclosure agreement that precludes production pursuant to a public records request of the information provided by Johnson Utilities. And it has been stated that in that agreement, Queen Creek agreed that these documents, all these documents were confidential. That is untrue. If you look at the first paragraph that was cited by um, counsel, um, he said that we agreed that all these records are confidential. That's not what it says. Number one, background facts. The parties here too want to discuss a transaction of mutual interest and in connection therewith, each party may disclose or grant access to certain confidential technical and or business information that it desires to be kept in confidence. This agreement is entered into in conjunction with and in support of that access and due diligence agreement between the town and the company. That paragraph establishes the purpose for which we received this information was for us to be able to do our due diligence. It doesn't say that these documents are confidential. It says they may be. And that's important because this document doesn't establish the confidentiality. What it does is it establishes a process for dealing with confidentiality if Johnson Utilities wants to claim they're confidential. That is, and, and the idea that this, is con, this agreement is somehow illusory or that if you uphold Judge Warner's decision that the whole system will fall, come falling apart is totally wrong. This is a standard agreement. This process is done every time a government entity deals with a private entity and they get information in. And a lot of times they get it for a variety of different purposes. There is a process in some manner set forth for where a party, if they believe some of that information is confidential, there's a process where they get the opportunity to go before a court or a process where they can say, we want to designate this information confidential. Which, by the way, they never argued, nor did they ever designate any of the information that was given to the Queen Creek as confidential, you know, write confidential on it at all. This, this agreement is entered into all the time. In fact, this is, this is 
the third time Johnson Utilities entered into this type of agreement in relation to trying to sell its utilities, which is it's marketed it to Florence, it's marketed it to Queen Creek, that standard. But another example of how agreement like this works is in every, every government procurement where you go out for an invitation for bids or a, a request for proposal. It says you, you require a bunch of financial information, you for, require technical information, all that from the parties who are seeking to contract with the municipality or government entity. It always says everything we get is subject to potentially to public records. If it's confidential, you need to label it confidential and you get the opportunity to defend the confidentiality. But it's not on the burden, is not on the town or the municipality to come up and say these are confidential or not. It is a process that is established to allow the Johnson Utilities, the party providing it. And that process was followed, and then some. It's so, Mr. Holcomb, so Mr. Fredenberg told us a little while ago that he, in his view it was the obligation of, of the town to request an in-camera review of these, of these records. And your position sounds like it's exactly the opposite. It is exactly the opposite. We don't have an obligation. Uh, our obligation is set forth in detail um, um, paragraph 8 is that if we get this request, we are to give notice to John Utilities, which was done. Which, by the way, I just simply summarize this. There is no allegation that what Queen Creek did in giving notice and giving the opportunity violated the MBA at all. So it's our obligation to initially tr maintain the confidentiality. We can't go out and just spread this around. And in fact, we did that. It was at ex specifically at my suggestion that we use an FTP site. Off the, off the town's server using the consultants who are going to do the analysis, which, by the way, this is, that is also standard. It's used for all, all kinds of ways to segregate information and make a place where you can get large amounts of information and only limit access. We did that so that we could preserve that universe of documents. When the public records request came in, we said, fine, we have those documents. We produced the emails that were on the Queen Creek's server, which they have admitted were properly produced, and which also all refer to the information that's on the FTP site. And we went forward, and then we said, we reviewed that and said, these are public records. We believe we have to produce them. And the actual letter, what we said to them, we did on March 19th, immediately after receiving the request, we said, we said, we've got this request. We provided it to them. We said, we're reviewing it. We will comply with our obligations on the public records law and the agreements and said, and, and said to Johnson Utilities, to the extent Johnson Utilities considers the documents and communications requested by the ACC to be confidential, pursuant to paragraph 8 of the mutual nondisclosure agreement, the town is providing written notice to Johnson Utilities to allow Johnson Utilities to seek such protective relief as Johnson Utilities deems appropriate. That's exactly what the, the nondisclosure agreement provides for. We did that. And we only had to wait 10 days. And the request said we'd produce it by March 30th. We waited beyond that. And in fact, when I didn't get a response, and all of this is in the record, it's uh, exhibits one through seven of our response to the temporary restraining order. It was all this was before the court. We contacted them again and said, we haven't heard anything. You need to take action if you believe this stuff is confidential because we believe we have to produce it under the public records request. They, and we waited. I then, we then provided them with the emails, the actual emails. They reviewed, reviewed those, said those are appropriate. We gave them a list of everything that we were going to produce. And we even did it in phases. We said we're going to do these in phases so that you have an opportunity to review all this stuff and, and take action. And they did. They just didn't carry their burden. And the, rec the, the law in Arizona is absolutely clear. The party seeking to preclude disclosure, um, it's their burden to go forward to the court and show specific harm will result from the disclosure of these specific documents. They didn't even attempt to do that. They had every opportunity, but they didn't even attempt to do that. As it was just stated in, in the argument made to you, the only thing they're asserting is that the non-disclosure agreement makes these documents confidential. And there is nothing, nothing in that, in that uh, document that makes these confidential. Another provision that was referenced but not actually read to you for good reason is about remedies. And the remedies provision, paragraph 15, that they rely very heavily on. Recipient acknowledges and agrees that any violation or apparent imminent violation of this agreement, so 
producing documents in violation of this agreement. That hasn't occurred, and we've never threatened to do that. May cause, may cause irreparable injury to the disclosing party, and the disclosing party is therefore entitled to seek, not to have granted, but to seek immediate injunctive or other equitable relief. Again, this document, which is a standard process, it is a standard document that actually Johnson Utilities required in our, doc, in, in our prior dealings with them and was carried over into this uh, transaction, sets forth a process that was followed. The burden was on Johnson Utilities. They chose not to try to, to, carry, to deal with that, and they have to bear the responsibility for that. Uh, before I turn it over to uh, the counsel for the um, uh, ACC, I do want to bring it. the Corolla report that they were talked about. I'm glad they talked about that because that is not um, one of the documents that's on the FTP site we're talking about, but it contains the information. It's an analysis that's done. So while that is not specifically on the FTP site, as counsel has recognized, whatever ruling you have in this case will impact the disclosure of the Crollo report. There's also a, another report called the Wildan report, which is a financial report, both of which are based upon the information that they're claiming cannot be produced. If that they are, although they were not on the FTP site, the ruling in this case will directly impact the disclosure of those documents as well. One last thing. They said uh, these documents we were volunteer, they weren't asked for. They're communications. As set forth in our briefing below, under the definitions in Black's Law Dictionary and the definitions in, um, in uh, Webster's Dictionary, communication is the expression or exchange of information. Or it also includes the information so expressed or exchanged. That's from Black's Law Dictionary. From Webster's New Collegiate Dictionary, the art, art of trans, the, excuse me, the act of transmitting or the giving or exchanging of information. What's on the FTP site was the exchange of information. And in fact, they, as they admitted that the um, ex emails that we gave them were properly disclosed because they were emails. Well, if we would have exchanged this information by email and said, here's all the information that's on the FTP site, their argument was, well, yeah, that would be properly disclosed. We did the FTP site to comply with the Non-Disclosure Act uh, agreement, not to try to bypass it. One other thing, there's a reference to also, which was uh, to uh, 39.121.D2, as set forth in, and they didn't argue this in their briefing, but as, as set forth in um, page 17 of the joint brief filed by the Queen Creek and, and the ACC, by law, that, that has no application to the town. It's, the law is very clear that, that, that there's a, the statute itself and the case law as cited in that footnote provides that the towns are not subject to that requirement. It only applies to agencies and agencies do not include municipalities. Okay. And with that. Council, just real quick. Sure. There's some indication that some of these records may include um, some private customer financial information. No. Does somebody need to look at that in redemption? No, these, this, doc, this documentation doesn't include, it's, it's, that doesn't include names and the, the, for the private customer information. We didn't want that. And what we were looking at is the company financial information, number of customers, income, things of that nature are included in those documents. But personal um, customer is information. The record huh? is the, so your representation here as to what's contained in the documents notwithstanding, is there anything in the record telling us that? No, because, again, because the plaintiff, whose burden is established the issues that were going to be de done or dealt with at the full trial, didn't argue that. Their, argue, their argument was, the, you have the NDA, right. everything's confidential. Right. But, no, we, and we, wouldn't, we wouldn't disclose We understand, uh, I have with me Holly Zoe, she's in charge of all of our public records responses. We're very careful about putting any type of information like that out. We wouldn't disclose that initially anyway because that's part of our obligation in disclosing public records. We also request an award of, an award of our attorney's fees as requested in our 
May it please the court, Naomi Davis, on behalf of the Arizona Corporation Commission. In the reply, Johnson questioned the reason for the commission's involvement and participation in this appeal. Well, the commission is here, of course, is the party seeking the public records from the town. The public records in question relate to the finances and infrastructure of Johnson Utilities, and Johnson is regulated by the commission. The commission represents the public interest in safe and reliable water and wastewater service. In fact, the ACC is constitutionally and statutorily tasked with protecting the patrons of public service utility companies, such as Johnson Utilities. Now, the commission tried to obtain the information it seeks directly from Johnson and was not successful. Then Johnson sued the town to prevent it pr from producing the same information. Johnson has thus effectively blocked the commission, its regulator, from reviewing records that relate to the state of the utility's finances and infrastructure. This was the subject of a lengthy investigation and hearing process relating to public health and safety issues caused by Johnson's operations. Now, the Commission's identity and the context in which, in which Commissioner Tobin's records request arose is relevant because it goes to the question of whether a recognized exception to disclose should apply. Here, Johnson has raised rather general claims of privacy and confidentiality, and what we don't know because it wasn't argued. We do know the nature of the documents relate to the utility's finances and infrastructure. That means that Johnson, as a public utility subject to regular review by the Commission, and which is a process, by the way, in which the public can participate, has no expectation of privacy or confidentiality in this material. And indeed, the content of the disputed documents was already discussed at length in the course of a 13-day evidentiary hearing, of which this Court may take judicial notice, which involved allegations of financial mismanagement and operational deficiencies. The hearing resulted in the Commission ordering an interim manager to completely replace the utility's prior management and run the company effectively. The Commission also has a pending rate case open with Johnson, of which this Court may also take judicial notice. So although the Commission has the information about what the disputed documents say, having those records directly is incredibly important for the interim manager in order to run and make decisions about the utility, and also to the Commission as it processes the rate case. Now, if these records were directly in the possession of Johnson rather than the town, they would be subject to the Commission's inspection authority under Article 15, Section 4 of the Arizona Constitution and ARS 40-241. So if the town were to follow Johnson's original instruction of providing the confidential information back to Johnson, those documents would still ultimately be subject to a review by the Commission and then ultimately to the public because the Commission, too, is a public utility. So you're, the interim manager is an agent of the Commission? The interim manager is acting at the direction of the Commission, yes. But is managing the company? Correct. But doesn't have access to these materials? Correct. Um, and because of the nature of the services uh, that Johnson provides as a public utility, that really makes the comparison of Johnson Utilities to a company such as Tesla or Apple inappropriate. Um, their expectations of privacy and confidentiality in the way that the company is managed, uh, the way the company's infrastructure, uh, the state of it, its finances, um, are completely different. So despite also, Johnson's representation about the illusory nature of the non-disclosure agreement. The agreement between Queen Creek and Johnson is nothing unusual. Uh, the Commission agrees with, with uh, the town on that point. Section 8 specifically contemplates the possibility of a public records request and sets forth a procedure for the parties to follow, which is what has occurred here. The court now has before it a de novo review of a legal question. Was the superior court correct in agreeing with the town that the disputed documents are public records? And if so, is the public's right of inspection outweighed by general confidentiality or privacy interests as Johnson has articulated them? The answer is no. Johnson has not met its burden. And does the commission agree with the town that any personal uh, financial information, the customer information, should not be made public? Your Honor, I would respectfully submit that that sounds like information that would not be subject to a public records request and appropriately withheld. So, so if there is any such information in the materials, you would not demand that the town release it to you? Your Honor, correct. That's correct. 
Um, the Commission respectfully requests this Court to affirm the Superior Court in its ruling by finding the disputed documents are public records, that no exception to their production applies, and um, that, th that the Town is free to produce them pursuant to the Commission's public records request. I see I'm out of time. Thank you. I want to begin by addressing some of the points made uh, in inverse order with respect to the interim managers. And again, this is why we don't argue things that are weren't developed below. There was no um, the, the interim manager hadn't been appointed when this preliminary injunction hearing was held. Um, the interim manager, in consequence of the ACC's uh, ruling and order, and then as um, directed by Judge McCarville and Pinal County Superior Court is that the interim manager has access to literally everything. They have control over the bank accounts. They have control over everything. So it's interesting to note that now we're hearing this need for the interim manager to have data which is now a year stale. And so the interim manager who's been operating the utility since August isn't here, hasn't requested the Corolla report, has access to all the data uh, upon which the Cor Corolla report is based. So I, I believe that's um, off point. Um, with respect to um, th this notion of, of customer IDs, this drives us, I think, to the point that, that the panel may have is why was there no in-camera inspection to, exact, to, to examine what the is is? And the point behind that and why the tr trial court erred is because the trial court didn't even analyze the issue of what impact the MNDA has on the public records request. The court merely found that the Griffiths exception, the two-part Griffiths exception to the statute doesn't apply because the court found that it had no jurisdiction or ability to direct the town to do or not do anything. And that's Uh, in, in which the court specifically held that the court may, uh, upon the request of the requesting party, conduct such an in-camera review. The requesting party, obviously, is the ACC. It would make no sense for uh, Johnson to request the court to hold an in-camera inspection when it's contesting that there, there are public records under the MNDA. And the, the, under the MNDA, the definition of confidential information includes, at the insistence of the producing party, information or data that it designates as confidential. So the town turned over control of that issue uh, under Section 2.1, where it allowed the, the producing party to designate whatever it deemed appropriate to be designated as confidential. No one challenged below the designation and the challenge that the Corolla report was protected by the NDA. And so to be clear, our position is that we met our burden uh, by virtue of the MNDA and by virtue of our, our objection via an application for TRO to protect that. If the, if the ACC wanted to challenge our designation of the Corolla report as confidential, it was incumbent upon them, and this is expressly stated uh, in the holding of the Griffiths Court, the requesting party is the one who, who asked the court to conduct an in-camera review. And so- Isn't the court's language on that tied to the facts of the Griffiths case where the, the, the um, government entity was withholding the documents? So that case is sort of the flip of this case, uh, or do I have that incorrect? You're, you're right, it, but, but the rubric, the rationale uh, still applies in that in any case in which there's a dispute regarding confidentiality or discoverability, it's the requesting party that asks, that challenges the designation through an in-camera review. Johnson already has the information. It's designated what it 
believes is confidential as confidential. And so back to your point, um, yes, Griffiths was in the inverse context where there was a request, there was a challenge by the employee um, over producing his personal emails. And then the court said, if there's, once you've, once the, uh, the producing party here, Johnson, has made an initial showing, as we believe we did below under the MNDA, then it's incumbent upon the question, requesting party to challenge that designation through an in-camera review process. And so the, the record below candidly wasn't developed with specific reference to what exactly we're all talking about because the trial court didn't even get to that le level layer of analysis. And in doing so, in, in the court holding, basically that the Arizona Supreme Court's uh, holding in Griffiths um, did not obligate the court to, do, to perform such an exercise completely skipped over the, the two-part analysis that's it's the law of the state and has been since 2007. Uh, I, I'd also like to address the, um, the analogy posited by Mr. Holcomb with respect to um, the procedure by which a uh, municipality or town engages private contractors through the, the bidding process. That's uh, controlled by law and so that is distinguishable from a volitional due diligence concerning a potential ac acquisition. They're not putting out a bid to the public for road, uh, for asphalt, for example. So this is entirely distinguishable uh, under the unique facts of a volitional due diligence period um, performed by the municipality. And that goes back to the threshold an issue, issue, which is, is the government and are the, is the public entitled to know what the government's doing on its official business carrying out its official duties? And we're simply not in that universe. And for that reason, the trial court erred in its initial analysis. To, so to summarize, uh, in the absence of the MNDA, um, we believe that the Corolla report is not a public record. We believe also because it's not a public record because it's a volitional exercise by the town in es essentially shopping and testing out whether it wants to, to buy a utility. Number two, and what I believe the court uh, clearly erred on, is not even addressing the impact of the MNDA under Griffiths. The second part, and Griffiths uh, explains that even if the court finds that it's a public record subject to disclosure, prong two of the Griffiths analysis is the balancing act. And specifically in the language of the balancing uh, of, of Griffiths, the balancing test is you, the, the trial court is directed to weigh the public interest in obtaining and having access to these engineering reports versus the contractual expectation of privacy that the parties already articulated and agreed to before the information was even provided. So the court entirely glossed over Griffiths, entirely glossed over the MNA, and for that reason, I believe the trial court erred. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. We'll take the matter under advisement and issue the decision in due course. We'll take a brief recess now to prepare for our next argument.